Natural doesn't mean good. If I say a behavior is natural, or that it evolved, some of you are bound to misinterpret me and think that I've just endorsed said behavior. For example, many of you will know that I'm vegan, but if I say into the microphone right now that humans evolved to eat meat, a factually true statement, many of you will react as if I've just said something to undermine veganism. But I haven't. This is fallacious reasoning of the variety common enough to earn its own name. Philosophers call this the appeal to nature fallacy. Just because something is natural or evolved naturally doesn't mean it's justified. It doesn't mean it's unavoidable and doesn't mean we have to tolerate it. Now, I've actually noticed this mistake is usually only made when talking about human behavioral biology. If I say that hurricanes are a natural phenomenon, nobody thinks, does Mackin like hurricanes? But if I say that infidelity is natural human behavior, and it is, and we'll talk about that, well, many of you will wrongly assume that I think cheating is all right, or inevitable. And I definitely don't think it's either of those things. Today we're going to talk about infidelity and a few other hurricanes of human behavior. Trigger warning for everything. I know a lot of families listen to this show and I know some children listen. Parents, make your own call here. But for what it's worth, this episode is definitely not intended for all audiences. Today... I had the privilege of speaking to one of the most influential psychologists in history, Dr. David Buss. In this episode, you'll get to hear our guest explain sexual conflict theory. You'll hear us debate some of the lines of evidence for why female humans and long-term pair bonds have clandestine affairs, or alternatively, why married women cheat. We discuss intimate partner violence, both physical and verbal abuse, and Buss explains that these behaviors while totally evil, um, are also perhaps evolved mating strategies. Buss also shares his take on why it's important for us to study these things, and he explains how we can use our knowledge of evolution to better the lives of victims and make all of us less likely to be victimized. We also discuss the evolution of stalking behaviors, sex differences in both perpetration and reporting, And we also took the last 10 minutes to discuss some of the fundamentals of sexual selection theory for anyone who's interested in the more technical side of things. Dr. David Buss is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also taught at Harvard, and his work has been cited nearly 85,000 times. It's hard to find a list of influential living psychologists that Buss is not on. And usually, he's not lower than 10th on those lists. He is the most heavily referenced evolutionary psychologist ever. He's one of the founders of the field of evolutionary psychology. He has made massive contributions to our understanding of sex and violence, especially our understanding of the universality and complexity of human mating strategies. And his new book, When Men Behave Badly, is my favorite book of the year. So if these topics are even slightly interesting to you, pick it up, you'll have trouble putting it down. It was an honor to speak to him, let alone publicly, and I hope you all enjoy the show as much as I did. All right, so David, I was at a pub last night with other students and anthropologists, and your name just kept coming up over and over again. Uh, Someone brought up your legendary cross-cultural study on mate preferences from the 80s. We talked about that. And then someone changed the topic to their dissertation on the evolution of disgust. And Diana Fleischman was brought up, who was your PhD student. So we started talking about you again. And then we got to talking about my dissertation on infidelity. And again, you soon entered the conversation. And when we later talked about Bateman's principle, your name was raised. So this wasn't a David (laughs) Buss themed night. Uh, It was really just another night at the pub. And you are the elephant in the room whenever anyone wants to talk about human behavior from an evolutionary perspective. So it's such an honor to speak with you today. Well, thank you. That's cool. I wish I, I could have been there at the pub with you having a, having a pint. I know, I know. It would have been nice. And uh, when I said I was interviewing you tomorrow, it was kind of like a, a bit of a magic trick to be able to pull that out. So it's good to have you on. Um, I don't think today's topics, though, will be super accessible to someone who has no knowledge of sexual conflict theory. 
Uh, would you mind giving my audience a mini lesson on sexual conflict as a foundation for today's conversation? Sure. Well, very briefly, uh, sexual reproduction evolved from asexual reproduction. So once you have sexual reproduction evolving, that means that there are two sexes, uh, and sexual reproduction evolved about one to two billion years ago. So it's very ancient, and humans, of course, are a sexually reproducing species. And once you have sexual reproduction, what you typically have is a division of, of labor where uh, I, I should say the sexes are defined by evolutionary biologists according to the size of the sex cells, the size of the gametes. So males are defined as the ones with the small gametes, females with the large gametes. So in the human case, we have uh, sperm, which are basically small packets of DNA with an outboard motor. Uh, designed for getting as quickly as possible to the egg uh, and with very little else uh, added. Uh, the females, the eggs are large, they're nutrient rich, uh, they contain a, a lot of uh, information and adaptations including a cortex that surrounds the egg that the sperm has to burrow through in order to get uh, to fertilize the egg. So once you have uh, sexual reproduction, you have the evolution of conflict between the sexes. Because what that means is that there are what I call zones of conflict where what's advantageous for a male, uh, the optimum differs for, from what's advantageous to a female. So that when you have differing optima for males and females, that means that selection will create what is a cumbersome term, but it is technically sexually antagonistic coevolution, and what that means is that there are, will evolve adaptations in males to influence or manipulate females to be closer to their optimum, and conversely, adaptations in females to influence or manipulate males to be closer to their optimum. Let's say that it is an optimum, an optimum for a female to require a male to invest uh, a certain amount uh, prior to consenting to sexual intercourse. Whereas from a male perspective, the optimum might be somewhat less investment. And so if, those, if you have these differing optima and those optima recur generation after generation over evolutionary time, then you will see adaptations, counter adaptations, offenses, co-evolved defenses, and so forth. And so the what my book is really about is on uh, uncovering what these offenses and defenses are by I, uh, starting with identifying the zones of conflict, that is the zones in which males and females differ in their optima. So amount of investment before sex um, is one uh, amount of time that you let elapse before consenting to sex uh, is another uh, display of certain mate val uh, valued mate qualities is another. So just to give one other example, uh, and, then, and then I'll stop with this um, brief introduction, is uh, mate value discrepancies. So if you have a guy who's a six and a woman who's an eight, uh, then uh, but the guy thinks that he's an eight, and we know that men on average, especially a subset of men, tend to overestimate their desirability on the mating market, then you have this zone of conflict where he thinks that he is in her mate value range and wants to mate with her, uh, and she thinks he's not good enough. Uh, and so you can have zones of conflict over perceived mate value and perceived mate value discrepancies. And so there are many regions of this, uh, these zones of conflict, involving that, that range from, you know, uh, conflict on the mating market, so before men and women get together, conflict within relationships, so things like uh, infidelity, sexual infidelity, uh, financial infidelity, emotional infidelity, uh, uh, diversion of pooled resources to one side of the family versus another, uh, conflict over whether a breakup should occur, and then also conflict in the aftermath of, of breakups. Uh, and, so, um, and so I talk about all these things uh, at different 
so what I call like temporal phases of the mating process before mating, during the mating relationship, and then the aftermath of a breakup, where I get into some of the nasty stuff that men do, like stalking and within relationships, uh, intimate partner violence, and ways in which um, men and women in relationships try to influence their partner's perceptions of their own mate value, sometimes through um, abhorrent means like intimate partner violence. A lot of people listening are going to find this very counterintuitive, right? Because they'll know that males and females have the kind of broadly aligned goal of wanting to reproduce, but on the boundaries and in between, there's also this huge separation in goals um, where things aren't perfectly aligned. And that's really where the problems arise. So yes. today, a lot of what we're talking about is where male and female reproductive goals, specifically in our species, fail to align and the problems that come from that. Yes, that's very, very well stated. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because, um, you know, mating is often a very intrinsically cooperative venture where males and females cooperate to, um, to hook up, to mate for the long term and to reproduce. Uh, and it really, there's been a, a, a sea change in the field of evolutionary biology about this, where it used to be thought in evolutionary biology that cooperation really was the sole paradigm. You know, males and females cooperated, got together and reproduced and had an equal stake in the genetic offspring that they mutually reproduced. But uh, since um, re really uh, the 1970s, partly with Dawkins, partly with Jeffrey Parker, who was one of the founders of sexual conflict theory, uh, there's been a sea change in thinking about this where, con the, where there is still cooperation, okay, but there, as you, as you aptly mentioned, uh, regions of conflict where the interests of an individual male and an individual female depart. You know, and they, they depart, you know, in, in so many fascinating ways. And, and that's why, I'm, you know, um, maybe I have a, a macabre um, interest in this. But, uh, you know, to, to me, it's like, it's like Tolstoy said, you know, uh, all, all happy families are pretty much happy in the same way. All unhappy families are unhappy in their own individually unique ways. And there are all kinds of fascinating theoretically fascinating and, and empirically fascinating phenomena where the interests of a male and female differ, and so they get into conflict. Right, and one really clear place that I think we can start out where people will all immediately be able to acknowledge that there is, in fact, a conflict and that interests do differ um, is in the realm of infidelity. So our species is one in which we are culturally expected to settle down and have just one mate. Um, while there, it's actually a minority of cultures that are strictly monogamous, the vast majority of people, even in um, ostensibly non-monogamous cultures, will end up spending most of their mating career having just one monogamous pair bond at a time. Um, so most people on Earth are destined for a monogamous relationship, and in 99.5% of cultures, women specifically will be expected to marry only one man, often for life. This is called menandry in the literature. So I'd like to ask you two questions on this point. Uh, first, just so we kind of get the landscape here, exactly how monogamous is our species? And second, why do people in monogamous relationships have affairs? Okay, two, two very important uh, and, and high-level questions. So to address them in order, um, I actually think that uh, I would suggest that a conceptual reframing is in order. I think it's to characterize a species as monogamous or polygamous or uh, whatever, I think it, it is in some ways causes more confusion than clarification. Um, the way that I look at it is that humans have a menu of mating strategies. Uh, we have uh, mating strategies for long-term pair bonded relationships, um, which you could say are you know, at least somewhat mono monogamous. Um, and, and not all listeners will know that this is actually statistically extremely rare among mammals. Uh, something like 3 to 5% of all mammals have anything resembling this long-term pair bonded mating with one individual. Um, so, but we, we have pair bonding, but we also have uh, short-term mating. We have ca casual sex, brief hookups, you know, uh, short-term affairs. We have 
uh, one long-term committed pair bonded relationship with some short term on the side or even a lo another long term on the side sort of effective uh, polygyny even in presumptively monogamous societies uh, we also have um, uh, what you can call polyandrous mating where women have sex with two or more men and that gets to your second question why do men and women have affairs and if we, if we can switch to that, then uh, there are really profound sex differences here. And I should say that when we talk about sex differences, when I talk about sex differences anyway, we're talking about on average sex differences. And so rather than continually repeating the technically correct, you know, on average males and females differ in these ways, uh, we have to keep in mind that it's, it's on average and there are lots of exceptions. Uh, to that. But the, the sex differences that I'm going to be talking about are large in magnitude and highly replicable across cultures. In contrast to, as I'm sure many of your listeners are aware, that, you know, there's been a replicability crisis in the field of social sciences, even in, in medicine. But the things that I'm going to be talking about, these sex differences are highly replicable and large in magnitude. Uh, so equivalent in magnitude to, let's say, sex differences in uh, upper body strength, where men are about three times as strong as women in upper body strength. So these are the sorts of, you know, mag they vary depending on what we're going to talk about, but these are large and replicable. So, um, so when it comes to affairs, the sexes differ in the motivations for affairs on average. So for men, the primary driver although not exclusively, but the primary driver seems to be a desire for sexual variety. That is sheer novelty. The opportunity presented itself. Uh, I was uh, um, out of town and my girlfriend or wife wasn't around and this woman was signaling to me in sexual interest and so we hooked up for the night. Um, just uh, because it's there. Uh, now, Chris Rock, the comedian, I think I think it was him, he said something like, men are only as faithful as their opportunity. And I think that's an exaggeration, but there's something of truth to that. That is, men are motivated to have short-term sexual encounters when the risks and costs are, are relatively low, and especially if they're in a relationship, when they can do it without being discovered. And so that desire for sexual variety uh, is a key motive in about 70% of men. Now, when it comes to women, uh, women also have a desire for sexual variety, but it is not nearly as powerful or strong or uh, does not contain the motivational impetus that it does for men. And so it's been a big puzzle of what, why women have affairs, because it's costly in many ways. So women can, if the affair is discovered, it can, she can lose her primary partner's investment. Um, she can, she, women have higher risk than men of contracting sexually transmitted infections. Uh, women, more than men, sustain damage to their social reputation. So, so affairs are very costly uh, to women. And so what could be the benefits that might outweigh the costs to women? And in the evolutionary literature, there have been, there have been two key hypotheses, uh, and I'll, I'll mention them very briefly, one of which I used to favor and no longer do, and one of which I do favor and I've published on it. So the, the two hypotheses are, one is um, what's called the dual mating strategy hypothesis, and then the others uh, that I advocate is called the mate switching hypothesis. So the dual mating strategy hypothesis, of which I was initially very enamored, this has been put forward by uh, really excellent uh, scientists like Steve Gangestead, uh, Randy Thornhill, uh, Marty Hazleton, a former student of mine, now an eminent professor at UCLA. And what they argue is that uh, women basically are getting investment from one man, but good genes from another man. That could be genes for good health, for example, or a very healthy immune system. And so their argument really hinges on, or, or at least some of the primary data for that hypothesis stems from uh, ovulation shifts in mate preferences, where when women are ovulating, they argue women prefer males, prefer to have sex with males who have good genes markers. 
They argue things like masculine features, and there's a, a rationale for that, uh, as symmetrical features. Uh, you know, so we are a bi- bilaterally symmetrical species. We, you know, we have two eyes, two hands, and so forth, but we're all a little bit lopsided, a little bit asymmetrical. And, uh, and, so, but, and, and so the magnitude of asymmetry has been hypothesized to be a function of either high mutation load at the genetic level or environmental insults during development, which can you know, alter the, uh, the adult phenotype. Uh, so, so, so is it the case that women, when they're ovulating, do they prefer more masculine, more symmetrical men? Um, intelligence is another one that incidentally is um, moderately heritable and that initially had, they had hypothesized women would show a preference for when they're ovulating. So the early studies showed that these effects did indeed occur. And meta-anal- but meta-analyses and then subsequent large-scale studies done in uh, Germany and the UK have, have either failed to replicate these ovulation shifts or show that the effects are substantially weaker than the initial studies indicated. Um, and then, so that's, you know, so, so there's the primary source of evidence for the dual mating strategy hypothesis has been called into question, let's put it that way. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, and then, and then there are other, other weaknesses, but let me shift to the other and then we can compare and contrast the two. What I argue is that the primary reason women have affairs is a mate switching is what I call the mate switching hypothesis. That is, women uh, are with mates that they are unhappy with, unhappy with uh, emotionally or sexually or typically both, and that they are either using affairs as a backup mate uh, or to uh, put their toe in the water, so to speak, in the mating waters to see if there might be a better mate out there for them, uh, or as... um, you know, mate insurance if something should go wrong or to trade up in the mating market. That is to transition from uh, a lower mate value partner to a higher mate value partner. And so, uh, and and, and so, well, what is the evidence for this? So I, in the, in in my book, I I mention a variety of half a dozen or so sources of evidence, one of which is, uh, I won't mention all of them, but um, women tend to fall in love with and become emotionally involved with their affair partner. And this is a majority of women, something like 70, 75% of women fall in love with or become emotionally involved with their affair partner. Now, if what you're doing is just trying to get good genes from an affair partner, and then while retaining the investment of your primary partner, this is a terrible design feature. In fact, what you would want ideally is just get the genes and get out with no emotional involvement whatsoever, you know. And so the fact that women fall in love with and become emotionally involved with their affair partners uh, suggests something else. And um, uh, so, so that's one. Uh, number two is that women who are, emotion, as I mentioned, emotionally and sexually unhappy with their primary partner are more likely to have affairs. Now, this may seem blindingly obvious. Well, of course, people who are unhappy with their relationship are more likely to have affairs, but it's not true of men. So if you compare men who have affairs with men who do not have affairs, there is no difference in their marital or relationship happiness. You know, and, and the reason for that is that men are, uh, what motivates men to have affairs is that desire for sexual variety on average. Uh, and so now it's possible that uh, both hypotheses could be correct uh, in the sense that they're not, they're not intrinsically incompatible in the sense that some women, uh, perhaps a, a, a very tiny minority, are pursuing this dual mating strategy hypothesis, but, uh, a strategy of getting genes from one guy and um, investment from another, uh, and that the majority of women are pursuing the mate switching strategy. Uh, but I think the bulk of the evidence points to the mate switching. And, and what, one other piece of evidence has to do with the uh, genetic evidence of what, what are the actual rates of uh, m- mistaken paternity. That is where a guy uh, is investing in a kid in the mistaken belief that he is his own kid when in fact he's the neighbor's kid or the mailman's kid or you know the, uh, 
whoever or, or a work colleague of, of his wife. Um, and, and the early studies, and again, this is a kind of where the empirical evidence has kind of shifted over time. Early evidence has pointed to something like a 10 to 12 percent uh, genetic cuckoldry rate, whereas most recent studies uh, that are and, and meta-analyses suggest that it's more like one to three percent. And just so, to jump in on that point really quick, how, how has that um, not been confounded by women now being able to use birth control and specifically, deliberately, consciously choose which partner is the actual genetic father of their children? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's an excellent point, and I think that it's entirely possible that that it has, and that's why. You know, it's likely that the modern low rates of genetic cuckoldry uh, may not correspond to the rates of genetic cuckoldry that occurred over evolutionary time. And so there's there are some studies, I think that so Brooke uh, Skelza, uh, who studied the Himba, uh, suggests genetic cuckoldry at rates much higher uh, in, in that culture. But there haven't been really enough studies done of more traditional hunter-gatherer cultures to, to indicate what the rates are. And so, indeed, it's certainly possible that the rates of genetic cuckoldry were higher over evolutionary time than they are in modern environments with, you know, uh, highly effective uh, hormonal contraceptives. Uh, and, and that's why I don't, I don't place a huge amount of uh, weight on the, this particular evidence. However, uh, if the evidence came out that, let's say, you know, women who have affairs are indeed a substantial number of them are, are indeed having offspring with their affair partners while concealing it from their primary partner with the primary partner being totally oblivious to it. Um, if that number were high, then the advocates of the dual mating strategy hypothesis would be putting that finding in neon lights, you know? Uh, so, uh, so this is a case where there's an asymmetry, you know, in the interpretation of the, uh, of the finding. And just to mention one other one, no studies have shown that women favor intelligence uh, when they're ovulating more than when they are not ovulating. And again, this is one of those findings where it's, I mean, intelligence as a measure by IQ is, is one of the most highly heritable um, uh, psychological characteristics. And if it were the case that um, that that women showed a preference for intelligent men more when they're ovulating, again, the dual mating strategy uh, theorists would be putting that finding in neon lights right. and trumpeting them. And so the fact that it's not, they, it gets actually kind of buried in a footnote in one article and then not mentioned again. Although um, that, that, is one, that is one piece of evidence, though, um, in defense of those who support the dual mating strategy hypothesis. And for, for what it's worth, I, I really like both theories. I, I think your theory is very interesting for its um, consistency with what women who are having affairs actually say they're doing, right? They, they do say they're in love. They do say that they would want to pursue a relationship with the other man, um, so to say. Um, and I guess w one cause for concern would be on the dual mating side of things, the animal literature, the, the zoology literature is more consistent with what they say, like we see in studies of songbirds, that, that the homewrecker birds, so to say, um, tends to have indicators of higher genetic quality, such as longer tails, better singing, and they rarely um, repair with those males. I guess on, on the intelligence point, I would say that I could imagine it being the case that a more intelligent partner is valuable both as a resource provider and as a genes provider. And so there would be kind of a neutrality there. Um, whereas traits like more masculine features, deeper voice, things like that, indicators of high genetic quality, um, those things would only really be useful on the genetic side. Do you have anything to say to that? Or Yeah, you know, I think those are reasonable points. Um, intelligence is going to be valuable uh, in a regular long-term mate a, a, as well. Um, but um, I think you could, you could say the same thing about masculinity. You know, now, uh, that, that, you know, masculine mates are going to be more likely to be physically formidable and so m more likely to offer protection for their primary partner, um, uh, etc. So, but, but yeah, this is a case where I, I agree with you. I mean, in avian species, I think the dual mating strategy hypothesis has more empirical support. Uh, and as I mentioned, I mean, both, I mean, both are perfectly evolutionarily plausible hypotheses and they're not 
contradictory in the right. sense that a different women could be pursuing different ones. But I will mention one other finding that is, uh, would be puzzling on the dual mating strategy uh, hypothesis. And that is that, boy, uh, if you are a male, you're, you're the primary male, and your partner is getting inseminated, getting fertilized by her affair partner, uh, and you're going to invest 20 years of your life and your resources in a kid that is not yours in the mistaken belief that that's your kid, boy, that is a very costly form of investment. And in fact, the, um, you know, the fact that males in, in, among mammals have not been able to solve the con- paternity confidence problem is one reason why long-term pair bonds are so rare. Because in order to get males to invest so heavily in offspring, you know, you, they, they want to be sure, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing here, it's, I'm saying it's, shorthand for selection favored adaptations to do these things to ensure that they are their own offspring. Uh, and, and so we know that and we, we know that males, human males have these adaptations. They're, they do heavy mate guarding. Uh, they uh, are very suspicious of potential mate poachers. They're very attentive to cues to mate value discrepancies or perceived mate value discrepancies. So, you know, when they, when they don't have, um, benefits to provide. They often resort to costs to inflict in order to keep a mate. Uh, They do things, and I talk about this in the book, to manipulate their partner's self-perceived mate value. So if he loses his job, he's no longer as high in mate value as he formerly was, then, you know, so he was an eight, she's an eight, now he's a six. Well, he's going to try to manipulate her into thinking that she is not so hot, that she's perhaps a six also. And so that's one, and this may be a disturbing hypothesis, that one function of intimate partner violence is precisely that, to lower the the woman's self-esteem, to lower her self-perceived mate value so that she thinks, oh, no, I can't do better. I'm actually lucky to have this guy, uh, to deter defection from the relationship, but to deter both infidelity and to defer, deter leaving the relationship entirely. So, um, so, so, so well, I guess what I'm saying is back to the dual mating strategy versus the mate switching, um, we expect, and there's evidence for men having adaptations to ensure that they are not genetically cuckolded. And of course you could say, well, then they're going to be counter adaptations in women to evade the detection, which is also true. And there's some evidence for that, that I talk about in the book. Uh, But I think that, you know, on balance, if you say, okay, the dual mating strategy is the primary explanation for why women have affairs, I think that would be mistaken. And I would have said that uh, eight eight years ago, 10 years ago, I would have said, yeah, the dual mating strategy, that's, that provides the most powerful explanation we have. And, um, since then, looking at it a lot more carefully, combined with replication failures on, in the ovulation research, combined with an abundance of other sorts of evidence, I, I now favor the mate switching hypothesis as the primary motivation. And, and even these who don't exhaust the conceptual space of explanations. I mean, some women have affairs for immediate access to resources, for example, you know, which could have made the difference not so much in modern times, but ancestrally, when food was scarce through evolutionary bottlenecks of ice ages and droughts and things like that, where obtaining food could make the difference between survival and death for a woman and her offspring. And so women could exchange sex for resources. And so that might be yet yet another hypothesis. Right. I'd like to, I'd like to dive deeper on a point you mentioned, because this is one that is really disturbing, uh, but I think necessary and substantial uh, part of your book, which is your work and the work of others on the adaptive nature or potentially adaptive nature of intimate partner violence. So obviously males and females in long-term relationships, um, oftentimes males to females, but the horror goes both ways, um, will often do and say terrible things to one another. And this, these behaviors on your account are arguably evolved. Would you like to explain this really counterintuitive and quite disturbing part of what you found here? 
Great question, and I do talk about that extensively in the book. Uh, to, to give a maybe a big picture, uh, just to broaden out your question just a little bit, and then and then dive deeper into it, uh, is uh, you know humans have adaptations to do bad things to other humans, so aggression, uh, violence. I even argue I have a whole book on homicide, uh, uh, the murder next door, why the mind is designed to kill, where I go into um, you know adaptations for killing other humans. Uh, but here we're talking about violence within relationships. Uh, and uh, one, in, in a nutshell, uh, aggression pays uh, or sometimes pays. So now in, in relationships, um, so, so one way to phrase it is you can think of two broad strategies of ways to keep a mate. So we, we know that, you know, divorce rates uh, occur throughout in, in every culture Breakups occur, uh, and often there's an asymmetry in who wants to break up. So one party wants to break up, the other does not. That's actually typical. It's, it's very rare that you know two parties say, oh, yeah, actually, things aren't working out. Let's just shake hands and go our own separate ways. Uh, and for males especially, loss of a primary partner is um, a devastating blow, um, especially if there's a mate value discrepancy where he perceives accurately that he will be unable to replace her with a woman of equivalent mate value. And so the two broad strategies that you can think of to keep a mate are one is bestowing benefits, uh, providing a partner with the qualities that were part of their initial selection criteria to begin with. Um, And these could be, you know, time, attention, resources, gifts, um, investment in children. Um, You know, there are many ways to provide benefits. But if you lack the benefits to provide, then another strategy is to inflict costs. And Daly and Wilson are two evolutionary psychologists who first kind of highlighted this point that when it comes to intimate partner violence, it tends to be men who lack the benefit provisioning capabilities that resort to the cost inflicting capabilities, uh, st- strategies. So, um, so well, well, so if you have intimate partner violence, and and you're absolutely correct that it does run both ways. That is, women uh, beat up men, and men beat up women. And the fact that we have uh, weapons and tools and frying pans and knives uh, is a somewhat of an equalizer in this respect. Um, you know, given that there are natural, on average, strength differences between the sexes. Okay, but what, what it turns out is that the more extreme the intimate partner violence, that is the violence that really does damage, tends to be more male to female than female to male. Uh, and so, um, so, so what does this occur? Well, there are hallmarks of um, design features for functionality. So one is, let's just even take a... a something that's not physical violence, verbal aggression. Okay, how do men uh, do that? Well, one of the things our studies found is that men tend to insult their partner's physical appearance. Okay, you're ugly, uh, you're, you're getting fat, your thighs are heavy, you look like shit. You know, so, you know, derogating specifically a component of female mate value that is central to her self-perception of her mate value and also central to others' perceptions of her mate value. Okay, then when you get into physical violence, well, what does physical violence do? Well, it actually literally uh, uh, damages the woman's physical appearance. And so that's why women who are in relationships where there's intimate partner violence, they wear sunglasses, they, they use uh, makeup to cover up the bruises, they wear turtleneck shirts to cover up the bruises, you know, long sleeve shirts and so forth. Um, and so, uh, so the, the damage is in this example, this one design feature of precisely how men damage women is it affects their self-esteem Okay, which has been hypothesized to be a, an internal monitoring device that tracks your mate value. As we, ha- we have to track our own mate value, uh, and it's more or less accurate, and there are exceptions having to do with narcissism and so forth that we can get into. But if, if a man can succeed, if a, if a woman 
is uh, with a guy who is not providing the benefits that she believes she is entitled to given her mate value, uh, and he starts inflicting costs, well, uh, this can affect her self-esteem and hence her self-perceived mate value. Uh, and, and, uh, and in addition, it can affect her literal mate value because, as I said, these the physical damage um, uh, can destroy her or, or damage her physical appearance, which, as we know, is a key component of women's mate value. So, um, and then even some... Others, uh, other design features that are more, you could even say even more insidious, is that it turns out that there is a sharp uptick in physical violence, male to female violence, when the woman becomes pregnant, and especially when he, she becomes pregnant and he suspects that, that she might have been unfaithful and the kid might not be his. And there's one study that showed that the physical uh, the blows to the woman tend to be directed toward her abdomen, you know, which suggests even something, a, a different function, which is that the function of that is to literally terminate the, uh, the, the growing fetus uh, uh, in, inside her, as opposed to the functions of trying to deter an infidelity or de- deter a defection from the relationship. And so, um, so all, all the data are not in on this, but I think that the hypothesis that uh, intimate partner violence has a functionality with some of the design features I mentioned is, um, is a hypothesis that has to seriously be entertained. Uh, future studies will you know, confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis, but so far um, it seems to be the case. And uh, and, and we can even add sort of ancillary findings that bolster this, and that is that men who engage in the physical violence, this intimate partner violence, also tend to do things like uh, try to cut off the woman's relationships with her friends and family, uh, monitor her time, insist on knowing where she is at all times, uh, let him know even if she's going to leave the house to go to the grocery store. So the physical violence coincides with another sort of suite of heavy mate guarding on the part of the male. Right. Uh, And so that also suggests functionality. I think this theoretical landscape that you've just uh, painted for us is very clarifying, um, albeit disturbing. And to just kind of summarize um, the findings you've just reported to me, if a man is with a woman who is out of his league, he might engage in verbal abuse to lower her self-perceived mate value so she doesn't notice that she can do better. He might use physical abuse to actually interfere with her displayed mate value. Um, And he might use a suite of toxic mate guarding behaviors to control her, such as cutting her off from her family, to stop her from um, presumably having an affair or mate switching out of the relationship. And he might even use, um, and and this is where um, the data really gets, um, where more data is definitely needed, is it might even be used as a um, anti-infidelity strategy to protect paternity. So so with all that kind of in mind, this is really disturbing knowledge to hold. How can we use it to better the lives of women um, and to protect women and, and of course, um, to a lesser extent, just because of the rates of effect here? to a lesser extent, men, um, from these horrible, horrible things that happen? How can we use yeah. our knowledge of evolution to better the lives of people? Yeah, great, great question. And I mean, this one of the goals of my book is to reduce conflict between the sexes, especially of the more abhorrent varieties. And we haven't even gotten to sexual assault and other uh, sexual harassment and other um, forms of conflict between the sexes. But um, I'll mention at least one way in which I think this information can be valuable in reducing conflict. And that is that in one of my very first studies of married couples, I found that there was a correlation between verbal abuse and physical abuse. So that is, they, they tend to co-occur. And so um, what another way of phrasing that is if a partner, from a woman's perspective, if she perceives that her partner is starting to cut her down, insult her appearance, if he's starting to monitor her 
time do heavy mate guarding if he's starting to cut off her relationships with friends and family, which are basically another element of this is friends and family are bodyguards, you know, and so this effort to cut off her relationships with friends and family, if he's doing these things, even if no physical violence has occurred, these are warning signs. These are danger signs. And so I would encourage women who see these danger signs to do things like uh, cultivate bodyguards, make sure that the family, the brothers, the sisters, uh, female allies, male friends uh, are aware uh, of these things so that they can uh, interfere with the success of the strategy of the mate guarder who's trying to cut them off. Uh, and, so, uh, and so these are warning signs even before physical violence, violence occurs. Second, even if mild physical violence start, starts to occur, it tends to escalate over time. And so one of the things that happens is, you know, guys, you know, they'll, they'll engage in a physically violent act and then profusely apologize, uh, try to convince the woman that the reason that they did it is because they're so deeply in love with her. Uh, okay, but it's a danger sign because it tends to escalate over time and repeat itself over time. And so, uh, and so I think that women can use these both to cultivate bodyguards and perhaps to get out of relationship before it turns really violent. So, uh, right. so those are, those are a couple, a couple of thoughts on that. Yeah. Excellent. This, this is related, um, but kind of in a different section of the relationship. So the most surprising and interesting part of your book for me, um, just cause I was familiar with some of this research already, um, was your work on stalking. I think as upsetting as these topics may be, most educated people, at least biologically, um, will be able to accurately intuit the potential evolutionary drivers of evil behaviors like sexual harassment and assault that you talk about in your book. But stalking, I think to many, will seem to be just the most flamboyant waste of energy, like lasering in on one potential mate, following them around, monitoring their behavior, pestering them with a range of advances from unrequited love notes to threats and it'll all just seem really wasteful and helpless but you quite um strongly argue that stalking often quote unquote works and part of the problem here is that when stalking works it's not called stalking so would you elaborate on the adaptive value or the potentially adaptive value of stalking for my listeners and kind of paint the picture where stalking when it fails is just classified different to when it works Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great questions. Um, so, so first of all, just by clarification, uh, I don't argue that stalking often works, often it fails, uh, actually. And here we have to distinguish between a pattern of behavior and a pattern of behavior that crosses the line into criminal stalking. So, uh, and the difference here is that criminal stalking, the way the laws are written, is it's a pattern, a repeated pattern of behavior, like following repeated phone calls, uh, you know, even leaving gifts or flowers, uh, showing up unexpectedly at work or home, that, that this repeated pattern of behavior has to instill fear in a reasonable person. Uh, and so, uh, and so, many of these behaviors are part of normal courtship behaviors uh, if they don't evoke fear in the woman. So that as a guy is showing up, he's giving gifts, he's dropping by unexpectedly just to say hi to her, uh, bring her a sandwich at, her, at lunch hour, uh, calling her up just to check in, see how she's doing. And so and so, if these, if these things are welcome, then they're not classified as uh, criminal stalking. It's when they invoke fear that they're classified as criminal stalking. So that's that's one thing. So in with uh, Josh Duntley, again, a former student of mine who's now a professor in a criminology department, uh, we studied about 2,500 victims of stalking. Now, these are typically um, victims that where the threshold is going to be crossed into criminal stalking. And one of the hallmarks that we found there is is, well, I should back up even one step uh, beyond that. Most stalking behavior is mating related. Uh, it, that is, it is motivated, and, and the largest category of the mating related stalking is among partners who were initially together and then have broken up. And often the stalking will start 
you know, when a breakup is in the process of happening, that is the guy will, uh, and I say the guy because it's uh, about 80% of the criminal stalkers are men and about 20% are women. So there's a pretty large sex difference, but there's, you know, a non-trivial percentage of women who also do this behavior. Uh, so they, they um, so what they're trying to do is, uh, is regain mating access to the woman uh, and or interfere with her attempts to mate with anybody else. And, and these things sometimes work. Uh, and I say sometimes because um, we have one woman in our study who said this, um, my former boyfriend, you know, basically would stalk me. And anytime I tried to go out on a date with another guy, he would threaten the guy and scare him off. And she said after six months, there were no guys left around. And so I went back to my stalker. Because uh, there were no other guys around. Okay, but the reason that it doesn't work in the ma- majority of cases is that there's, we also found this, there's a huge mate value discrepancy. That is, at least on the part of the, the victims, they perceive that they're much higher in mate value than their stalker. Uh, and so the st- from the stalker's mindset, he thinks, well, she was with me once or she went out with me a couple of times. We had sex once or twice, or we were in a relationship. Maybe that can get her back, uh, or even even if I can't get her back permanently, maybe she will. I can get her back short term for a brief sexual encounter or two. And so, part of this has to do with what the alternatives are for the male. So, a even a low probability of success is better than zero success. And so if this guy is low in mate value and he perceives that he cannot attract any other women, then uh, stalking can have the effect of, uh, even though it's not a great strategy, it's a terrible strategy, uh, it, even if it works some of the time, it's better than having a strategy that works none of the time. Uh, and then you combine that with the fact that some percentage of women do get back with their stalkers, even even. Uh, either for sexual encounters or back in long-term mating relationships. Yeah, this is just something that made me think. So you generously shared that you were actually a victim of stalking behavior yourself at one point in your life, but you didn't report it or act on it because you just weren't too worried about it. And when I read that, I went back through my own life in my head and realized that I've actually been a victim of many of the behaviors in this book perpetrated by women But in all cases, I just brushed it off and never really thought about it again. And so I do have to wonder how much of the reported sex differences in predatory sexual behavior are merely a result of a sex difference in willingness to report. How much of a discrepancy do you think there is on things like sexual assault, sexual harassment, stalking? How much of a data problem is there with the fact that when men um, like us are victimized by these behaviors... We generally just don't do anything about it. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a great question, and I think there are two elements to your question that I would want to differentiate. One is the reporting issue. Males and females might have different thresholds for reporting, but the other, and this applies to both intimate partner violence uh, uh, and stalking and and sexual harassment, by the way, is that. Uh, the same pattern of behavior is more likely to evoke fear in a woman than it is in a man. Okay, uh, and so and so for crim- in, cr- in the criminal stalking case, in that case, it has to e- evoke fear in order to qualify as criminal stalking. And we know that men and women differ in their threshold in their fear thresholds. That is, uh, 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 and it is also probably the case likely the case, I would say 99% sure that it is the case, that stalking is more physically dangerous to women. So it's unlikely that the, I mean, even though there are movies like uh, uh, Fatal Attraction, you know, where the woman, the stalker is like boiling the rabbit, the pet rabbit and so forth, um, that these are, these are fairly rare. Whereas we know that guys, um, uh, they're stalking when they do stalk. It tends to escalate, and it escalates into threats of violence, and then sometimes actual violence, and sometimes murder uh, of the victim. And so, women's fear 
uh, I think is actually quite a reasonable fear. I don't think it's an irrational fear. Whereas guys, you know, so the woman's showing up, she's leaving. You know, in my case, I, you mentioned my case, a woman, uh, she left uh, every year on my birthday and then on Valentine's Day, I assume it was a she, I don't know that for sure, would leave some gift or a note or in one case a, a coffee cup with hearts all over it. I call it my stocking mug. I still have it. You know, I, and I never found out who this was, but I didn't walk around feeling fearful about it. Whereas, whereas a woman that who experienced that same pattern of conduct might experience fear uh, that there's some guy lurking around, tracking her, following her, and you know, and showing interest in ways. So, so I think that's one issue: is uh, the sex difference in fear. Yeah. And I just, uh, I just noticed something in my own response there that when you said, when you're talking about this and talk about the, the, I, I involuntarily laughed and I'm just realizing that if I were hearing a woman telling the exact same story, I would feel just no compulsion, um, to chuckle. So it, 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 it is, there is a discrepancy in terms of how we as men react to the same threat. And I think it is reflective in the fact that like the threat isn't actually the same. A, a female stalker is, a bit of a nuisance. Um, a male stalker is absolutely terrifying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and then so I think that that's that's one issue. And then the issue that you brought up is the reporting issue. And I think that there is a reporting issue, um, like for example, with intimate partner violence. And I talk about that in a little bit in the book, where a guy who gets clocked on the head with a frying pan and he's bleeding. Uh, you know, he calls the police and says, my wife just, you know, beat the shit out of me and I have a concussion and, and a, a wound in my scalp. Uh, police are more likely to say, oh, look, look, I, look, you're a guy, you know, um, they're more likely to laugh it off. Uh, it's perhaps um, a behavior that's more likely to evoke shame. And, uh, and I report one case where a guy reported to police and the police said, look, if she so much as broke a fingernail, then you're going to end up in jail and she won't. And so there is a sex difference in how police respond to reports. And I think that um, that, that also is going to affect the reporting rate where guys are embarrassed to report it and it's taken less seriously. And so I think that both of these factors are true. The, the fear factor where there's a sex difference in fear that I think realistically tracks likelihood of violence and then a reporting problem that you mentioned as well. Excellent. So I have, uh, I'm conscious of your time, but I have a question that um, my colleagues won't forgive me here if I, if I don't bring it up with you. And this is a really theoretical one, so it might um, be missed on some of the listeners, but I just need to speak to you about it. So a fundamental tenet of your work here is the idea of female choosiness uh, contrasted with male eagerness on the mating market. And this sex difference is axiomatic to most work on sexual selection. It, it's it's a fundamental of basically half the research on sex differences in evolutionary psychology. And for those listening, uh, th this idea goes back to an experiment done in 1948 by Angus Bateman, uh, in which he ostensibly showed that male fruit flies have greater variance in reproductive success than female fruit flies. Um, that is to say that many males reproduced a lot and many not at all, whereas most females reproduced an average amount. And he also claimed to show that while male fruit flies benefit from adding sexual partners, female fruit flies do not. But recently, in the past decade, people have gone back and shown that, first, his data didn't actually show what he said it did in his discussion. In his own data, female fruit flies reproduced with multiple partners and benefited from that effort. And second, and really worst, Bateman's experiments don't replicate, which is to say that if you recreate Bateman's experiment, it doesn't give you the data he said it would. Uh, female reproductive success actually does increase with more mates, and more and more studies on wild animals are showing that female sexual behavior can hardly be described as passive. It, it, it is very much enthusiastic and active and interested in diversity. So I'd love to know just what are your thoughts on the recent failures of Bateman's principles to uphold themselves in the lab, and do you see this having implications for your own work? Um, yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, just to almost take these in reverse order in which you raise them, um, a, a Darwinian perspective, an evolutionary perspective, going back to Charles Darwin, never viewed females as passive in the mating process. Darwin himself invented sexual selection theory 
of which the, one of the key components is female choice. So the fact that females have evolved choice and they do in all known sexually reproducing species tells you that women, females and women in our case are active strategists, not passive recipients. And I've written extensively about that. And just even the things that we've been talking about suggest that women are active strategists you know, in pursuing affair partners under certain circumstances, like when they want to do mate switching, uh, etc. So, so an evolutionary perspective in no way uh, implies that women are passive in the mating process. Both sexes are active, um, evolved strategists. Uh, so that's, uh, that's with respect to that. Second, um, uh, I, I don't give too much weight to the Bateman study in particular. You know, Bateman was, was one study. But what I would do is I would say, look at, the, look at the human case. We know with the human case that all the records show that uh, a smaller subset of men reproduce compared to women. And we know this from the molecular data. You know, in the extreme cases like what, what, what I call the Genghis Khan effect, you have uh, a, uh, a chromosomal marker of Genghis Khan that is present in some uh, 16 million men in and around the former Mongolian Empire. Uh, and everywhere where you see, and you see this also in Ireland and in Scandinavian countries where there were, you know, basically genetic sweeps where uh, uh, resident males get displaced by an invading group of males and that, um, that uh, again, a, a larger percentage of females reproduce in, in every place that's looked compared to a smaller percentage of males Reproducing, And so I think that the fundamental asymmetry between the sexes in this uh, is absolutely applicable to the human species. It may not be applicable to all species, uh, but it's certainly applicable in the human case. And this in no way contradicts the notion that women are active mating strategists. They, they are. And, you know, my view has all the studies that I've done since I first got into this. Um, both men and women have strong mate preferences. Both men and women compete vigorously for access to desirable mates. Both men and women derogate their same-sex rivals. Uh, both men and women do mate poaching. So, so every study that I've ever done has included men and women as active strategists on that. But I don't think that... I, I guess I, my nutshell on the Bateman is I don't place too much weight on that. It's possible that his, his particular study doesn't replicate, but the asymmetry in reproduction uh, does occur in our species, and all the data supports that. Combined with what we talked about here is that, um, yes, w the benefits of infidelity for women, well, that's adding additional sex partners, but it benefits women in different ways than it does for men. For men, the primary constraint on reproduction has always been access, sexual access to fertile women. And, but for women, adding additional sex partners per se does not benefit her. But if she can trade up in the mating market, or according to dual genes, uh, the dual mating strategy hypothesis, if she can obtain better genes for her offspring through an affair partner, then in those cases, or, or obtain additional resources, in those cases, absolutely adding additional sex partners can be reproductively beneficial for females or could have been over human evolutionary history. And so I think that, you know, what one, you know, there's always um, in the field, and I'm sure you know this, that, um, you know, study the, studies that come out and say, actually, this adds incrementally to a large body of research that we've known and supports a certain theoretical premise. Uh, nobody pays attention to that. Study comes out and says, oh, this overthrows entirely everything we've ever known about human sexuality and mating. Well, that gets all the news and gets uh, trumpeted. Um, but I think that has not happened in this case. That was very well answered. I'll definitely be forwarding that around. David, I'm very sensitive to your time. So I just want to take a moment to applaud you for your book. It's been very popular. Uh, but it's also been really well received and deservedly so. Uh, in publishing this uh, without a storm of controversy, I really feel that you've managed to walk through the rain without getting wet. Most authors, if they attempted to write a book about the adaptive nature of our worst behaviors, 
would really be risking, they'd be risking writing their own career's obituary uh, because these topics are so hard to handle with the respect and care that they are owed. Um, I hope we've done that today, but I know you did it in your book. Thank you for writing it. And I look forward to engaging with whatever you put out next. Thank you. I, I very much appreciate it. I appreciate the conversation and I appreciate your last comments on the book. I mean, I, as a last point on that, I, I was uh, at some point I had concern about precisely that issue of, you know, I'm dealing with very controversial topics um, and we didn't, didn't even really get into sexual assault or sexual harassment, which I also cover in the book. Um, but I think that, you know, partly just through talking with and showing the manuscript to many, many female colleagues of mine helped a lot to um, treat these these important these topics are too important to be ignored, and so uh, and so I think they have to be uh, treated and but treated in a sensitive manner because they are personal to a lot of people and upsetting to a lot of people, and so I feel very fortunate that uh, that the book has been well received really um, uh, across a wide variety of people uh, who you wouldn't ordinarily expect to um, embrace a book of this sort. So, um, you know, as I said, my goal in writing the book is I want to reduce conflict between the sexes. I think that when it comes to things like stalking and intimate partner violence and sexual harassment and sexual assault, most of us, most men, most women, we want to get rid of these things. We want to eliminate them. We want to reduce them. Uh, and that's really greater insight into the causal origins and mechanics of these abhorrent forms of behavior is critical to eliminating them. And that's what I hope the book, book does. All right. Well, I hope so, too. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a delight. Thanks for listening. Thank you to the donors who paid for Dr. Buss's recording equipment, as well as all the hosting and services we use. We literally couldn't do this show without you guys. Your generosity makes this podcast possible, and you should be very proud of that. Thanks again to David for coming on the show. The link to buy his book is in the show description. As he touched on, there are entire subject areas in that book that we didn't even get to interact with today. And he goes into much greater detail on the subjects we did have time to talk about. I'm also trying something new today. I've attached a bibliography. I always do this for our regular shows, but I haven't done it for an interview yet. I don't know of any other podcasts that do that, but I made a few factual statements in here, as did Dr. Buss. Most of our statements are backed merely by the citation of his, again, fantastic book, When Men Behave Badly. But for a few specific points, I thought attaching another source would be worthwhile. Next episode will definitely be a traditional animal episode. I'm really excited about it. It'll be just like old times, um, but we will also be mixing in more shows about human evolution going forward because the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Happy holidays and a very Merry Christmas to all who celebrate. I'll talk to you again on Boxing Day. Until then, remember to be kind to animals.